What's up everybody, welcome to the show. Today we are going deeper into structural balance. We're getting into the good stuff today and talking about how to assess your body using strength testing. This is something that really sets our UMS program aside and allows you to completely customize your program. What's up everyone, welcome to the show. If we haven't met before, to my left is the adorable Phil White. Across the table. We got the Adonis Rad Bormeister behind the camera. The voice of God, as always, is Richie. And we are Unity Gym and the Unify Movement System. Uh, we turn driven people into strong, flexible athletes. If you want to know more about how we do it, the biggest insights, aha moments, and lessons we've learned in our training and training others, you can download our blueprints. They're available on the website or in the description of this replay. Big shout out to everyone on the podcast. We are cranking and growing, and uh, I really have to I owe a lot of that to uh, this guy right here. The people on the podcast can't see me pointing to Phil White. Uh, and a big shout out to everyone on YouTube. Uh, the YouTube tribe is growing massively too, thanks to Richie. He's uh, taken over managing the YouTube channel, which is awesome. How are we all today? How are you, Rad? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, ready to get into the structural balance, strength testing stuff. It's a good topic. Yep, like strength, like testing. Yeah. Strength testing is going to be a good job. That's right. <laughs> so very quickly, I want to just reframe what we talked about yesterday in case you missed yesterday's show. It was an absolute cracker and very important because we talked about the length tension test that we do and the symmetry test that we do in the beginning. One of the more important things we talked about is that you know, assessment can become stifling. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to strength training or if you're new to structured training, and that's why we created the foundations program it, uh, uh, in the Unify Movement System, because it just builds a nice ba- um, foundation, as it's called. You know, it teaches you programming principles. It, I, it helps to really cover the most common sort of areas of the body that might need a little bit of work, strength, stability, and um, load uh, tolerance increased. And um, it, it then really sets you up for your first testing week that we do in the UMS where you don't get overwhelmed by the data, you, you know how to use it. Because assessments are only as good as your strategy to use the data. And uh, I, I, we, we loathe people who over assess and under uh, sort of prescribe, I guess you would say, maybe, you know, like you want to you want to assess for a reason and you want to be able to utilize that data and uh, and build yourself a good program, you know, so. To and use it in an ethical way as well, like give people a really useful information that doesn't just freak them out and think that they have a million things wrong with them or, you know, that their body is weak and broken and, you know, totally like everything's all horribly wrong. Like we want to use information to be like hey here's what we could improve on here are some weak links and if you bring it up like we'll we'll really you know take you kind of the next level like that's one thing that really gets my goat yeah, yeah. So and that's ethical that, use of that's what we've found and i'm sure rad will be able to um uh agree with this that's what we found when we released the foundations program and the result we had you know when we were assessing people immediately as they came into the ecosystem and i'm not talking about experienced people here i'm talking about people who are new to structured training they may have done a bit of strength training before in the gym but never to a structure to a periodized program and that's very very different because now we're doing all the things we spoke about yesterday we're training in balance we're training joints in balance where we're training the body's symmetry uh by using unilateral movements all these sort of things and what we found is that it was really empowering because people would come in and they would get an initial result and even people who felt like it was uh, a regression for them do the foundations program and then they they don't they won't shut up about how amazing it it, it, um, changed them how how much they adapted don't you think yeah absolutely it's um, a lot of people call used to call it a beginner program but it's not a beginner program it's um i mean you know you use you're lifting weights so when you lift weights you just choose the intensity that you want intensity refers to how heavy the weight is and you know there's not many beginner weightlifting movements it's you know you're lifting weights you're lifting load and and uh, when you do it the right way um some of the 
Some of the most seasoned veterans get the most challenged from the foundations program, and and, and who that's was, who was just the guy it's simple does not mean it's e like movements easy. are easy. Yeah. Yeah. Who was the guy who's p just posted his one arm pull ups recently? Ben Lodge. Ben, ben Lodge. Lodge. Now he came in being close to being able to do one arm pull ups, mm -hmm. and then he went and did the foundations program, and did his and then first came out and did his first one arm pull up. Yeah. You know, which is a perfect example of the fact that just because it's a foundations program, it, it like mm -hmm. if you're if you're dealing with structural imbalance that are li li uh, become a limiting factor and this is what Charles used to say w what he uncovered and he talks about this a lot in his T Nations um, uh, article that I'm going to share with you guys uh, he talks about um, that they're becoming a limiting factor in a joint when the ag agonist antagonist structural imbalance is so bad then there'll be a limit to how much strength you can get out of that joint that you cannot produce true strength in that joint because the joint is, is instable. And, and just for those playing at home, that antagonist and agonist are basically either side of the muscle, so like hamstrings and quads. So just that's right, yeah. Translate. And so that's why he went so deep into this with professional athletes, because it, it, it dramatically improved their performance. And yes, it does sometimes feel like a little bit of a regression, but it is, uh, it, it is certainly not. You know, you come out of it stronger at the other end. And of course, even in the foundations program, you can select your weight that you're lifting. So you yeah. just because you do the foundations program doesn't mean you have to go and lift baby weights, you know. Yeah. Uh, and just with um, like why that and and take like basically opposing muscle group strength is so important is like if it's been a while since we did a big shoulder I guess we stepped away from doing kind of mm. lots of physio related shows but when we used to go into like deep into how shoulder works and how the rotator cuff works and and basically like limiting glide in joints uh, that's what like balance strength does it limits like unwanted excess sort of gliding movement in joints which make them inherently less stable. So if we can get really good balance, then the stabilizing muscles that, that have to limit the glide don't have to do much work because we're nice and balanced. Um, and the body is very good at shutting down um, movement and strength and spasming around areas if it doesn't trust movement. So by getting good strength development, you also get better mobility because your body trusts going into positions. So little Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and and, and it, ma it, it makes perfect sense. And the reason why I want to say that before we get started today is because I love these assessments. I love these assessment protocols. You could say that this is mine, Rad's and Richie's life's work put out there to the world and this makes up the UMS program. You can go and buy all of our great standalone masterclasses. Uh, we used to even sell the structural blueprint as a standalone program. We do sell the uh, strength and flexibility essentials mini course, which is all the theory behind our program, but we removed this from it because this is the secret source about the UMS. And as much as I like it, you, what I'm saying is you can still, you know, um, go and do a really great program and, and get really great results without uh, going through these assessments, you know, I, um, and, I, and, and in many cases with, uh, with a beginner, when a beginner comes into our ecosystem, they see all this great stuff and we always say, just start with the foundations program first. Yeah. Just start with it. Don't get overwhelmed with all these amazing shiny objects. Just start with the foundations program first because you're going to get an incredible result from that alone and it's going to set you up to be able to understand and decipher. <laughs> and the way that, like, yeah, the, the way that the foundations program and, and all the whole UMS progressions and, and everything about what you guys do, which is why I was so enthusiastic to get started with you, you know, um, working with you a couple of years ago, is like you've thought about how the human body as a system should work and then you have to design a program which basically gives like and like the right amount of each of the things so that the whole system no matter kind of what you do will be have like a balanced training approach and so it kind of doesn't like you can get all this like information from from testing and then it's like what are the end result oh let's make the system work better and yeah. it's like oh, okay great we've, we've already ticked that off so like yeah yeah that's and, right exactly yeah. so i think exactly. that's why it's like you know people if they get kind of paralysis by analysis and get stuck thinking like oh it's like i've not got some optimal thing. It's like, okay, well, it's just like work on the system as a whole, get everything moving. And then once you've got your technique down, once you've kind of got like a true expression of what actual strength you have by getting the neurolog neurological adaptations, all those things that take a bit of time to come on, which is something I know that if you've just listened to the episode, you may not know about, we've talked about it before. Um, yeah, you it, it the testing won't be as useful information. So. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. let's... Sorry, go on. No, no, it's all right. You go. I, I was going to say, why don't you, uh, why don't we go through and just talk a little bit about what the strength testing is? And we, we sort of, um, 
I guess before we do that, <coughs> I just want to stop for a moment and, and uh, take a moment to really, really make sure that before we go ahead and explain what the tests are and what the protocols are that we use, that we all understand the reason why we do it. And, and I know we've said this over and over again, and we've just pre-framed it really, really well, and you've heard from Phil, the reason for structural balance in a joint, uh, and, and we, like, we take it further and we simplify it more by saying structural balance in a movement. So what your rowing should be as opposed to your bench press, and what your chin up should be when compared to your bench press and what your front squat should be compared to your back squat and, 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 and then your split squat and your step up and your rotator cuff, um, uh, its ability to produce force in the external rotation movement. And all of these variables come from a lot of data points uh, taken from some very, very good strength and conditioning coaches and sports and exercise scientists around the world. We've really latched on to two of those people, um, uh, Tony Bataji and Charles Poliquin. This stuff was popularized, to my knowledge, by Charles Poliquin, uh, the late Charles Poliquin. Tony made his um, adaptations to it, then taught that to us, and then we went and took that and made our adaptations to, to it. I was lucky enough to learn it from both Charles and Tony to see the differences and the little nuances. Um, and uh, it really is um, a means to prevent glide in the joint, to reduce injury, to maximize strength and performance. And we like it best because it produ produces or provides I guess a direction for people to head in that is structured, that it goes beyond just choosing movements for ego or aesthetics or choosing movements to try and compete with your friends. Oh, well, my mate can do a hundred kilo bench press, so I'm just going to do bench press for the next month and try and beat him. You know, this gives you a structure that's about balance. And that I think in and of itself is really, really beautiful. So yeah, look, I think the best way, one of the best ways to describe it is um, the answer that we gave to that girl yet, uh, on Tuesday, I think, when you were here, where she said, I can't remember her name, but it was a question on one of our live shows where she said, my traps are really tight. What do I need to do to fix them? And Phil's answer was create balance in the joint and it'll take care of itself. Because one of the, one of the most common reasons why people say, oh, my, my traps get really tight or I feel like I can't stretch them out is because there's not a good balance in the shoulder joint and so the traps are uh, you know when you combine that with the stress of the way that people sit at their computer when they they really activate their upper traps it creates this feeling like you've got a lot of tightness back here um, and then in the same way that when you when you talk to somebody like Bass our friend Australian strength coach um, who's a phenomenal power lifter and the trainer of um, some of the best athletes in the world in, in different areas his approach to mobility is if you've got a tight muscle, you strengthen the opposing muscle to create symmetry in the joint, which is um, which which works for what he does. We go deeper with mobility, of course, with what we do. But you know, this the, the way that I think people in general have been approaching their training incorrectly for a very long time, which is that they try to compartmentalize an issue and say, "How do I fix this one thing?" rather than looking at the body as a as a whole and say, "How do I create balance in the body?" And if you if you do that first then so many of the issues that people think are very unique to them, they just get taken care of on yeah. their own. Yeah. And like, and I've learned that, you know, we've been teaching structural balance more and more and more, but what's really um, blown me away is that in the past two years since we've had Phil on the show all the time and what I've learned to understand about injuries and about injury rehabilitation is that so many injuries, the approach to injury rehabilitation is okay, well, let's just regress so that you're not feeling pain when you exercise, but we're going to stimulate the Unless joint. Unless it's tendon up there, then you should feel pain. Yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but train the joint in an optimal way that creates balance, and then, you know, you, you, you rehabilitate Which so many injuries. To be very clear to people, it was very frustrating to me as someone who wanted to learn cool shit that was complicated, and, like, I could do some <laughs> voodoo magic and, like, really wow people with, like, all these, you know, fancy techniques and fancy exercises that people haven't seen before, and, you know, that really captures people, like, you know, 
Yeah. Well, I was like, oh, it's actually really simple. And people are just really bad at doing simple things consistently. Yeah. Yep. Like, <laughs> and, and, like, and, and you know what? And this is exactly why the foundations program is a set program. Because after writing programs for so many people for, for a decade, for Yanni and I, where as a personal trainer, you, you kind of, like when you're a juvenile personal trainer, you have this fear that somebody's not going to stay with you if you're not giving them something unique and something exciting. Yeah. And there are certain people out there that, that are like that, that they, that like, well, where's my new program? Where's the latest thing? Or why am I doing the same thing as that person? But Yanni and I did it for so long that we started getting to the point where we we're going, you know, all of these people need pretty much the same thing at the start of their journey. And so to demystify it and to make it a simpler approach, that's why the Foundations program is a set three phase program, because it's just like what Phil said, you need to just tackle certain things before you move on to it. And then that's where the strength testing comes into play. But you know, going back to this structural balance thing, why create structural balance? Because creating structural balance fixes more problems than anything else. Mm. That's why and that's you what do it. Char that's what Charles found, and that's why he made it so popular. And I remember that period. Uh, there was a period of a few years where I was changing exercises in programs for the sake of changing exercises, despite the fact that I knew that doing so was creating an inferior program, because I was genuinely I had we dominated our our local gym when we were working as a franchise trainer there, and it's, at one point I had five trainers working for me or with me. Uh, doing my programs and um, uh, or leading people through my programs and <laughs> there was a day when we looked around on the gym floor and there's about 20 people doing basically the same program at the same time you know and they're all lining up to use the same equipment but, but we <laughs> sadly like, became known as the injury rehab um, trainers because we were better at rehabilitating injuries than any other trainer at, at, at the fitness first and the down funniest there. thing was that we never produced one injury rehab program yeah that everyone was doing a preparation foundation just, foundations program program. just to prepare them for the big stuff coming yeah. and uh and yeah everyone was like this is amazing and that's everyone's what made it so popular you know better, yeah. and knees started feeling better and yeah people were coming up to back. me going oh, i want that shoulder rehab program that you gave my mate that, that he reckons his shoulders have never felt better i'm like i didn't give him a shoulder rehab program we just gave him a structural balance <laughs> just program, gave him right? a structural balance program it's yeah. the program i give everyone and they're like yeah. oh man I want that, but yeah, it was. It, it, it's funny the way that this all came about. But so, anyway, but 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 once we got so so we've talked about the foundations. We've talked about the reasons as to why we do that program. But what the the whole structural balance strength testing that we do that we're about to talk about now is really the the what the entire UMS progressions program is built around because what it's designed to do is. It, it assesses everybody on an individual level, and then it allows the individual to recognize their imbalances where they need to put a little bit of focus and then to, uh, to create the program for, for themselves. And it's a very simple process once you understand how to do it, but it can be quite overwhelming for people the first couple of times they do it, which again, and, and I'm just gonna keep banging this drum, which is another reason why we encourage people to do the foundations program first, is to remove this overwhelm, you know? But basically, um, you know, everything is benchmarked off the bench press and the back squat. So we figure out what the true 6RM for the bench press and the back squat is, which means it's your six repetition max, which means you couldn't do a seventh rep if somebody was holding a gun to your head at this weight. So you find, yeah. and, and that takes a, and, a lot and of- getting, you, you guys are very strict about tempo and form and yeah. whatever, like, whereas, yeah. you know, it's not like grinding out six ugly reps, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's my 6RM, yeah, it's- yeah if you yeah. fail the tempo with the metronome so yeah, yeah. so we use a yeah. very, we use a very strict tempo which is a 30x0 tempo which means 3 second eccentric or on the way down which is not the scientific explanation of eccentric but it's the way that people seem to understand it so on a squat it's when you're going down on a bench press it's when you're lowering the weight um, three seconds eccentric, zero second pause, as fast as you can on the way up, and then a zero second pause. And just very quickly to build a little bit of context around why we use the squat and the bench press, they are the, um, the for the for the last uh, couple of hundred years that we have data points from scientific um, from. Um, sports science and, and strength and conditioning, they are widely accepted as the two most common exercises to use as benchmark strength for the lower and upper body. <coughs> and they, across most of the testing, most of the, most of the literature that they looked at this stuff, they were the two consistent movements for high-performing athletes. 
all high-performing athletes, despite whether it was Dan Baker's um, um, study on uh, NRL players or um, a bunch of other uh, um, of the studies, they, they, they all had very consistently a strong squat and a strong bench press. And so they became accepted as the benchmark upper body and lower body strength test just in case someone's going well why didn't they why don't you benchmark it against the chin up or yep. uh something like that you know mm -hmm. the so bench you if, if you've got a good strong bench and a good strong squat most likely you're going to be a pretty capable yeah and they're easier to measure and control than pull up with calisthenics obviously being harder yeah, to right. like be precise about weight yep. so yeah exactly yep. 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 anyway so then from there there's uh there's 13 other lifts which all um you know over these um you know decades of comparing athletes that Yanni's already pre-framed where these, why they use these lifts and where these numbers come from, they're all compared to the bench press and the back squad. And the, you know, there's certain ratios that they should be and, and if the ratio is out, then we can tell you know, that, that those lifts need some priority. And, and the lifts are the dumbbell external rotation from the knee, uh, 30 degree barbell bench press, 30 degree incline barbell bench press, a barbell front squat, a dumbbell trap three raise, the barbell bent over row, uh, a back rack barbell split squat, flat dumbbell chest press, seated barbell overhead press, conventional barbell deadlift, kneeling single arm row, a chin up, supinator grip chin up, uh, seated behind the head press, and a back rack barbell front step up. And just as an example, just just to throw out one example of, a, of, of two common lifts that most people will be able to relate to, the, um, the conventional barbell deadlift should be 120% of your barbell back squat. And that is, um, at least in our gym, at Unity Gym here, those are two of the lifts that are most commonly out of whack. Um, and that's, that's really normal. Yeah. When I went through the data again the other day, there are, that, there are, a, like a lot of different theories yeah. behind these percentages mm -hmm. and they sway in one direction to favor movements very much based on the athletes that were studied. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. give you an example, if you're in a pulling sport, like uh, a rowing sport, then you'll always have a better deadlift than you, w the, than you will a squat and you'll usually always have a better um, chin up than yeah. you will a bench press. Yeah. And, th and so those... Those variations fluctuate. The numbers that we've come, uh, that we've narrowed it down to, are, are based off Tony Bataji's numbers, which were suited to general pops that weren't training specifically for a sport, mm -hmm. just for balance mm -hmm. in the body. You know, because you can argue, oh well, yeah, it might be better to have a better deadlift for this sport and that sport. Mm -hmm. You got to remember, we're training people for absolute balance, just setting you up so you can go and deploy that strength and, and skill you want. in any sport. And, and and these numbers also align pretty well with um, a couple of people that we've spoken to personally and asked them based on all of their years in the industry, what they think good numbers are for a generalist mover. And most recently, again, I checked with Sebastian Oreb, who has so much experience, um, like his entire skin in the game. business is around weightlifting and numbers and working out ratios between bench squat, deadlift, all these things. Like, he, and, and he's, the way that he talks about how he got these numbers, like the amount of work that he's done calculating things and comparing all these athletes and um, you know this idea of a generalist mover being somebody that's not a, a weightlifter is, is just somebody that's training on their own and isn't on the gear um, it's 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 uh, accepted between multiple different people that uh, a one and a half times body weight bench press uh, for this is all for one rep two times body weight squat two and a half times body weight deadlift um, 150 percent body weight pull up like these numbers they all work in quite well with what our ratios are yeah, yeah. um which is really so interesting with him because that like that's it I'm, I'm very glad you, like that's a generalist who's not kind of specializing into powerlifting because with him he's got a 400 kilo back squat but in a 340 um deadlift, deadlift. deadlift. Yeah, so yeah. that it, it once you get to that extreme level we are into like total specialization it becomes um about like anatomical like Me mechanics mechanics because yeah. he's got he's a shorter dude shorter arms yeah. Um, yeah. perfect for a squat and a bench press terrible for a deadlift yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, yeah. that's yeah, just yeah, a really right. yeah. thing, thing in mind but so, digress yeah <laughs> so you know we had recently we had Scott um, Scott West was saying you know I've got the um, 
I've got the stru uh, structural balance uh, assessment sheet and I figured out where you got it from. He, he let me know. Uh, it was actually one uh, as a file, a downloadable file in the UMS Movement Mastermind from back when this was the group for our uh, online coaching group. So it's been removed now. Yeah. So unfortunately, if you didn't get it, you've, uh, <laughs> you've, you've missed out on your opportunity. Um, but he said, what do I do with the information once I get it? Well, that's the secret source. Yeah. That's once you get the information, how do you use that to create a program? And, and, and that's absolutely what we go through in, in the UMS program is that we teach people how to use this data where it tells them where the imbalances are, how to create a program yeah. that fixes those now, imbalances. One, you're, you're gagging to say something. You go, you go first. Uh, yeah, I just want to do my technique uh, rant again. That's what I was <laughs> just about to go okay, into. Good. And, and it's really interesting. I, I, I would love to, um, I, I won't do it, but I would love to read the email that I sent out after Monday's show, uh, I had a, a, a really, really good response from, and the email was um, specifically talking about the need to separate training and competition. And I highlighted my passion for CrossFit and, and watching CrossFit, not participating in CrossFit, I never have, um, but I like to watch it because of the fact that I'm very passionate about gym and weightlifting. And uh, you know, CrossFit is like the ultimate sport to watch if you love weightlifting or gym. You know, it's it's a mix of everything. And um, what I, I I highlighted what I disliked about the CrossFit movement, which was that accidentally it blurred the lines between competition and training. And what that the result that had was really quite a negative impact on a lot of people's physical capability because you know you, you can't turn up unless you're David Goggins, you can't turn up and compete every single day. Yeah, and even David Goggins found that that destroyed his body, you know. Um, the body just can't withstand that level. No athlete, no professional athlete could go, okay, I'm going to play a match every single day. You know, but that's what CrossFit did for a while, and and they've largely, to my knowledge, just realised, geez, we can't tr we can't do wads every day. You know, you got your training is meant to be different to competition, uh, and I and I was really thrilled to have a CrossFit um, uh, instructor who owns a who, who owns a gym in Illinois in the US email me and ask if they could f share that email to their database and give us credit for it because this is an, uh, so, like something that really needs to be addressed in a lot of people's training, not just CrossFit. This is not isolated to CrossFit. Anyone who trains with their ego, who turns up to the gym to, to, to outperform someone else or do something, or the moment you bring competition into your regular training, it can be a little bit of a, it can be problematic, you know, because the reality is training is not meant to be about the ego. Competing is certainly yeah. e ego driven, you know, and, and we, we, we even said, and I said in this email and we spoke about it on Monday, we believe for that reason, it's important to have an outlet to have a means to compete, whether that's a, a sport, whether that's calisthenics like we do here, whether it's CrossFit, whether it's rock climbing, like a really cool hobby like that, physical hobby. It doesn't have to be a competition, but it needs to be something where you can e express your strength. Otherwise, you know, you know, Maybe. I mean, well, yeah. there is training for health, you know, and I get that. It's okay. And, you know, some people train like a bodybuilder to, to just look really good, you know, but we believe that it's a lot more motivating and rewarding to have a really good out outlet to demonstrate your strength. And, and as I said, we use calisthenics. Calisthenics yeah. is very much about showing off and doing cool things, but we don't train like that every day. And these assessments are not like, don't, don't mistaken the name strength testing for, okay, I'm going to go out there and just do as heavy as I possibly can, no matter what happens, you know, as long as I get the lift done. It's not a powerlifting competition, yeah. you know. You want to go ahead? Yeah, so my uh, rant is about, like, with so with the structure balance blueprint, if anyone's uh, got that and looking at it, um, there's basically, like, a few tests in there, so, like, a um, mobility overhead squat test. And, and I think it's just really important to kind of understand, like, at the beginning, when you try a overhead squat test for the first time, you will suck at it. Like <laughs> you'll just, it is the most like, it looks like it should be so simple. It's so cruel because it looks like a really simple thing and then you try it and you feel like you don't know what this weird body you've, you're inhabiting is. Cause it just like doesn't kind of work. Unless especially, you, especially when you look at Rad's photo of a perfect yeah, overhead exactly. squat. Exactly. Like, oh yeah, that, that kilos, looks fine. You know? <laughs> uh, but it's so hard. And if you like have all those, those observations and diagnosis about what the, um, you know, 
if something happens, then this is probably what's causing it. That is very, like, these things are true for someone who is a very good overhead squatter um, and has practiced her technique and can, like, think about all the right things at the right time and have has the right sort of foot position and, and like, all of those things. If your technique is, tr like, correct, then the, this diagnosis is true. But just you've got to be aware that when you're starting out, as I said the other day, with, like, a squat, if you don't know how to, you know, do the technique well and you lose tightness in your upper back, you will not get a true expression of your strength. So it's just so, so, so key to like work on nailing your technique and getting like really as the best you can at it because then the information you get will actually be really useful and, and usable because I just hate to see if like someone was trying these things and then they get totally derailed by trying to hunt down, as Rad was saying, like going down to that really specific thing and missing the big picture just because they've got information that's maybe not that useful because their technique sucks. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And uh, and that's why we say that it's it's better in the hands of someone who's got a little bit more experience, you know? Yeah. And and, yeah. and we have these two pathways for a reason when you come into the UMS online coaching group, we start you in the foundations or we start you in the progressions. Uh, and then we also have a, all, all our injury rehab modules just in case you do come in with some sort of a compromise in your body that needs specific work. But, you know, the, the idea of doing these assessments as an assessment, as a, yes, they're a strength test, but they're also not there to test your ego. Mm. They're there, they're, there's very, very specific <laughs> criterion that we follow to make sure that it's a true test, that it's not testing ego. And it takes time to learn how to do it even properly, which is why we say to people, that the first two times they do it, you're not even testing. All you're doing is learning, learning how to do the movements, learning how to do the tempo and all of that. Yep. Um, Aiden's got a really good question here. I'm glad you asked this, Aiden. Uh, he said, do you guys usually get people to be as balanced as possible before going into calisthenics moves? Absolutely. Yep. And I'm going to tell you why we do that. I tested this myself by pursuing calisthenics full steam ahead for about two or three years and I did not make the progress that I felt that I should have for the amount of time invested. I really thought that training five to six days a week for two and a half to three hours a day in calisthenics with my level of understanding of movement would have produced a better result than what it did. Yeah, and you were unrelenting. <laughs> yeah, and, and not only that, we had all the best influences. Yeah, you know, we were yeah. getting programming I was learning, help from. I was the, learning the from best some people, really good. Like know. I didn't, and I did a lot of reading and a lot of collaboration with some people that are way better at calisthenics than I am. And I w went to workshops with you know people like Ida Portal and you know fitness FAQs and um, and I really you know knew how to write programs and it just didn't produce the results that I expected it would and not only did it not produce the results that I expected it, it would eventually when I got a little bit frustrated and tried to push a little bit harder I got a really really bad injury to my shoulder and then not only that Aiden we've had people come into Unity Gym who want to learn calisthenics and who have been going it on their own for several years. And they are some seriously strong, fit and good looking buff people and, and capable in the things that they've worked on themselves and also some of the most imbalanced people I've ever seen. Some of the most forward rounding shoulders because they've just worked so hard on these calisthenics pushing movements with no understanding of structural balance training. Um, and when you get people to that stage and also some of the tightest people, some of the stiffest, tightest mm. people. And then when you get people to that stage to undo that amount of damage is so, so hard to do. And then when you look on the other spectrum, where we've got people, so for example, Lockie, who's been here on the show with us a couple of times, who's our ultimate athlete for last year, who's been a member of Unity Gym for coming up to five years, who trained exactly the way that I told him to train, um, which is all about structural balance first and skills like pursuing the high level calisthenics stuff second. He's one of the most accomplished people in the gym. Yeah. He does amazing calisthenics, feats of strength, flexibility, unbelievable. And he's, he's, about to, he's either just about to turn 45 or he is 45. So do we usually get people to be as balanced as possible before going into calisthenics? Absolutely. Yeah. And we get much better results with people doing that. And I, since I've shifted my focus, 
my focus now for the first time in my life is 100% on structural balance. Even though I've trained in a way that, that would produce balance, um, I'm getting better results by every now and then I'll go and test calisthenics. I'll just see how I go with it and I'm better at it than I've ever been yeah. without actually training it. And, and just one thing with like the uh, progression into calisthenics, like one of the things that is inbuilt into the Unity programs is doing um, like wrist preparation, mm -hmm. all the, like the scapular um, sort of stuff that is so key. Like they're basically yep. like massive regressions of calisthenics movements. Yep. But if you have like zero of that and then you build up this great strength and you try and do a calisthenics, like, you know, some hardcore planche or handstands or whatever, and you haven't been doing that kind of like built ramping up your, yep. all yep. of those things that are just ingrained as part of the warmth that we do here, yeah. like you'll really struggle. And, e and even if you do, even if you yeah. do, we, we had a, um, a another, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I've, got, I've pressed the wrong one. I just I, I got to uh, Connor Connor O'Shea from our UMS online coaching tribe posted a question this week, which I can so relate to Connor if you're watching because we all had the same exactly the same thing happen. He's really dived hard into. Uh, he says, "Hey Yanni Bormoster, Rad Bormoster, Phil White. I started getting recurring upper trap and neck pain. Feels like a large knot and aggregated by the front body line." In the part, uh, in, um, he's he's been going all in on the handstand masterclass and the muscle up masterclass. Press to handstand. Press no, to. he's oh, saying, really saying handstands. Handstand. Okay, okay. Uh, or or just doing. He doesn't actually say. He says with the muscle up masterclass and handstand. So I'm assuming he's he's doing the handstand yep. masterclass. And and the same thing happened to us. Um, and and it w like the your body is not designed to do a lot of calisthenics moves, like mm. especially inversion handstands. Yep. You know, if you don't, I mean, he's got a little bit of um, he all he has to do is back off the amount of volume, and that's going to settle down and just give his body a little bit more time to adapt. If you don't do the prep work. That's not just a, I've just got a bit of upper trap and neck pain. That's like bl I've blown my shoulder out and uh, and I'm stuffed because that's what happened to me. Remember, yeah. we all ended up going to see Leroy because our shoulders yeah. were all ruined. He goes, yeah, you're standing on your hands and you've yeah. never done it before. Yeah. <laughs> like, it takes a while to adapt, you know, like, and you kind of go, oh, yeah, that makes sense, you yeah. know. But, yeah, yeah so the, the, it is really important to build that foundation of strength before and balance before you dive headfirst into Cali because it, yeah. oh, it's going to find you wanting and otherwise. It, and it goes back to uh, something that we talk about all the time, which is to be process driven rather than goal driven, you know, have your goal, set it up, but then focus on the process of getting there and the process of getting towards calisthenics requires some serious structural balance and it requires some serious conditioning and things like Things like conditioning your wrist. If you've got weak wrist, like people come to me and say, how long does it take to condition my wrist? If you've never done it before, ever, it can take years yeah. to condition your wrist. Like they well, are, like to be able to put the weight on the hands and handle that, you yeah. know, multiple days and, a week. And condition your wrist isn't like a end point. It's an ongoing, it's ongoing <laughs> man, process. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, yeah, I was like, yeah, last year I could do a handstand on the back of my wrists. Yep. And I stopped doing the wrist conditioning work because I just got lazy and started boxing and I hurt my wrists. And I've gone back and, go and and started doing the wrist conditioning again and going, oh my God, I've lost a lot of this. Like it's, yeah. it's disappeared. Now, I wanna finish on the, the notion here that we're talking about Cali and how much preparation you need. Remember, calisthenics is, a, in my opinion, a competition. That's your show off. That's how you demonstrate your strength. And to bring this back in alignment with what we've been saying, although we, highly recommend taking up calisthenics and it's a great way to demonstrate your strength to do the really cool movements unless you're really really at a, an elite level and I would even argue at that point that you're not always using them to train you're not training like that every day your day in day out training is about building up load capacity and 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 improving balance between strength flexibility at symmetry and agonist antagonist joint stability mm -hmm. um yeah guys that's it that's it um shout out to the guys who commented at the beginning simon and lee and aiden so i think and and diane who's gonna miss us when she goes back to teaching <laughs> next week, i know so, devastating yeah. thanks guys we'll see you uh all tomorrow where we're gonna wrap this up and um yeah give you some uh, some some more great info have a good day everyone Health is about performance, not just body image. You better be willing to accept what you're going to have to do to get there. We'll start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. When you nail that skill, 
It's there forever. The body image goal doesn't get you that far. It's the consistency and frequency that's gonna get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcut to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. It's the gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image.